Good afternoon, everyone, for this third round of our debate on uh, brain is a computer versus brain is not a computer or in other words, would we see singularity in our lifetime or not? And uh, as you can see, these are our uh, team members, uh, Joy, Mohammed, Arivati, Tilini, Usha, Karshani, and I. So we have combined all our ideas together and uh, Usha and I will be presenting you know, our ideas on our, the, the position that we have taken, which is brains in our computer. Or in other words, we will not see, see singularity in our lifetime. So let's proceed. So just to get started. Which one? Your voice is my voice. Okay, okay. So to get started, uh, here is one fact about uh, a machine, uh, the very popular machine based in Guangzhou, China, and the human brain. So as you can see, we have around uh, 10 quadrillion pressures per second in the human brain with a consumption of only 20 watts of power, while the most popular machine in, in terms of computational power uh, has 55 quadrillion calculations per second and with a consumption of 17.8 megawatts of power. So these are basically just two facts with regards to the, the human brain and the machine. So uh, with respect to our roadmap, uh, these are the points we'll be covering in our debate. So we'll start off with computing evolution, how computing has evolved over the past several decades, and we'll go down to the composition of the human brain. It will be very important to understand how the human brain is composed, how the human brain is constructed to you know, understand well its high level of abstractions, and then we'll dive into brain for computing inspiration. So we understand the brain, so how do we get inspiration from the brain to build more intelligent machines? Then we'll go to brain consciousness, we'll discuss a few points of brain consciousness. Uh, we'll see perspectives from cognitive neuroscience, uh, creativity and theory of mind, computational theory of mind and with additional examples, and then a few topics from Malcolm Gladwell's and Joshua Tannenbaum's opinion. Uh, opinions and we'll wrap up our debate with conclusion and finally we'll show what references we found out. So to get uh, an idea of how computing, at least the modern day computing started, it will be very important to have uh, at least some level of understanding of what this machine was about. So this was uh, Memex, a very popular uh, description by Dr. Van Bush back in 1945 about how you know the human memory works and how you know we can mimic the human memories you know associative traits or whatever into a machine. So this was what was described by Vanderbilt Bush back in the 1945 and that actually spurred you know so many uh, theorists, so many computer scientists of <coughs> the 1950s like uh, John McCarthy in 1956 and other computer scientists to come up with more advanced uh, thoughts out more advanced theories about computing in general. So it's all, at least the, the nowadays uh, computing theory, the nowadays artificial intelligence theories, it all started with Barbara Bush's uh, mimics. Then that evolved gradually to this machine. Uh, is any one of you here familiar with what this machine stands for? Or what does this remind you? That's an so you watched this movie? I didn't watch it. It's uh, a clip right now. This was like the most popular depiction of artificial intelligence uh, in uh, a movie last time I somehow tried to depict this called HAL 9000. So this was depicted in a 1968 movie directed by Stanley Kubrick. And uh, there were actually a lot of individuals, a lot of computer scientists. Stanley Kubrick, when he directed this movie, was advised by NASA and also Marvin Minsky, one of the leading fathers of artificial intelligence. Yes, what's this one? Yeah. So he was inspired, he was advised by Marvin Minsky, the guy, you know, one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence. So uh, this is a portrait taken from uh, 2001 Space Odyssey in 1968, uh, Stanley Kubrick. Then computing evolution has continued from then, you know, from the era of 
you know, 1956, uh, <coughs> John McCarthy in 1962 argument on human intellect by uh, uh, Douglas Engelbart, then, uh, you know, 1968, all these uh, depictions of what artificial intelligence would see in 2001, what they somewhat read to depict. So we went to, what about this one? Any one of you familiar with this one? This one is IBM Deep Blue, the machine 1997, you know, the machine that defeated a chess game, one of the grandmasters of chess, Gary Kasparov. So computing evolution, once again, you know, continued to what is the most popular one, probably, and the most eminent one uh, of cognitive comp computing, IBM Watson, in 2011, when uh, the, 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 the machine defeated the two most popular uh, the Jeopardy players. Ken and the Brad. So once again, uh, the computing evolution didn't stop, and uh, it all went to this. What about this chip? Anybody familiar with this one? Brain inspired chip, tuners, IBM tuners. If, uh, I think in the first class or so, this was uh, someone mentioned by Dr. Uh, uh, if you remember, Dr. Darmendra Moda, I think, yeah. So this was just one example, one typical example of uh, neuromorphic computing, how you know, scientists at IBM are working on emulating the anatomical, the neuroanatomical, and the neurophysiological layer of the human brain. And then computing evolution uh, continued all the way to, what about this, what does this remind you, what, what, what does this one stand for in your thoughts? What, what comes to your mind when you look at this picture? Which one? Innovation. Innovation, okay. That's very close. Any other thoughts? Creativity. Creativity, okay. Imagination. Wow, imagination, exactly. So now we have imagination machines. Uh, you know, these guys are even looking forward to building more imaginative machines and uh, Blue Sky won the winning paper was shared last time by Dr. Shaz, Triple AI. So now the computing has is evolving into this layer of uh, you know intelligence. So our question is, how closer will this computing evolution get to human intelligence? That is a question. Not only has computing evolution stopped at this stage, also we have this what they call quantum computing. So. As part of our uh, debate, we'll somehow cover that one as well. So, uh, to understand uh, well, you know, which parts of human intelligence, the brain's intelligence, can be emulated in a machine or not, uh, our team strongly believes it is very important to understand at least some level of each aspect of the human brain. And we have covered different layers. As you can see, the human brain is composed of different scientists, sciences of different components. One is cognitive neuroscience. So another is uh, neuropsychology, the one the most of us are very familiar with, the left brain, the right brain, you know, Sally Springer, all those stuff. And uh, neurophysiological layer we have in the human brain. Uh, we do also have the neuroanatomical layer where we deal with you know, the different anatomical structures of the human brain, like the parietal lobe, frontal lobe, post-neocortex, uh, or temporal lobe, all this stuff pertain to the neuroanatomical nature of the or the neuroanatomical layer of the human brain. Then we have uh, the neurogenetics layer of the human brain. So let's say, for instance, some individuals with extraordinary mental power usually are believed to bring birth to more intelligent individuals. So brain also have this, brains also have this, layer of the human intelligence. So it's very important to understand the neurogenetics layer of the human brain, to understand what intelligence as a whole means. And then we have the neurocytological layer. The neurocytological layer deals with neurons. So previously, neurons were believed to possess some qualities, OK? And you know, scientists were developing all these deep learning models to emulate what neurons do one way or another way. But now neuroscientologists have understood, and actually you know, computer science also have understood, neurons are way beyond than what we previously thought. For instance, previously, you know, 
Previously, it was thought uh, what deep learning scientists, what uh, computer science in a deep learning area could emulate was enough to understand the whole intelligence of the human brain. But research, recent research, uh, has come up with you know more somehow enigmatic theory, enigmatic discoveries about the human brain when it comes to particularly the way the neurons interact with one another. You know, neurons, how behavior is transferred from one neuron to another neurons, you know, and also how, you know, not just data are transferred from one neuron to another neuron. So the neurocytological layer is also very important to understand what lies under the hood of the human brain. Uh, another one is molecular biology. That's very, very important. So not only are, are you know, our brains composed of neurons or, uh, you know, anything, there of you know all the other stuffs we saw earlier, we have the molecular stuffs, neurotransmitters. We have we have stuffs like serotonin or dopamine. These are hormones. These are molecular biological hormones that give rise to one way or another way to our you know minds, perception, perception, consciousness, or whatever. So it's very important to understand the molecular biology how the molecular biology, how the molecules, how the neurotransmitters in our brain interact to give rise to our thoughts. And another layer is about the neuropsychiatry. So neuropsychiatry is basically how you know our mind through its experiences <coughs> would face some psychiatric disorders, some psychiatric issues. So this is also one aspect of the brain. So to understand the overall th the thought process of the brain or the intelligence thereof of the brain, it's very important to understand all these components because it is all these components that give rise to what we call the human intelligence. For instance, uh, there was one documentary I watched a few years ago. It was, you know, I think it was by Nova Science Now. How smart can we get? So last week we were having this debate about, for instance, imagination, and that you know Albert Einstein, for instance, you're talking of human intelligence. I think it makes a big sense to talk about one of you know, the most intelligent individuals. And uh, there was this post-mortem study of uh, Albert Einstein's brain. So Albert Einstein's imagination, imagination power was not because of his exceptional learning ability or his exceptional learning process he acquired through time, but uh, he had more folds, more convolutions <coughs> in part of the brain called the parietal lobe. So that is the neuroanatomical nature of his brain that gave rise to all this spatial temporal transcendence of his imagination. So everything we see that lies under the brain, the physical stuffs, have all this uh, imagination, all this intelligence outcomes when we somehow go down to you know the brain side. So it's very important to understand the whole composition of the brain to understand and somehow to internalize and get inspiration to model more intelligent systems. So in line of this, uh, here is our uh, position. So for instance, the memory of the brain. Brain, this is brain for computing inspiration. There are some aspects of the brain that we can take inspiration from to build intelligent machines. So one of these uh, can be for instance the memory. Memory was originally uh, you know, inspired for mimics, okay, in, uh, by Vannevar Bush when he described mimics in his uh, 1945 paper, as you mentioned. Uh, for instance, the human cognition and anatomy has been an inspiration for an example in knowledge representation and learning we see, for instance, in IBM Watson. Also, the anatomical and the physiological layers of the human brain uh, have so far been inspired, has been in, have been an inspiration for what we call neuromorphic computing, just like what we see in IBM Tronors, okay? And then we also have here the neocortex or the psychological and cognition layers of the human brain, where this is just, you know, pattern recognition theory of mind. It's not still feasible. It's not thought to be feasible, but if even if we consider it feasible, what we try to emulate is just the neocortex it has a little psychological and still the cognitive layers of the human brain. Now, uh, when it comes to imagination machines, if you read the papers, these guys, you know, those guys who were talking about previously, there was this probability 
probabilistic generative models. Now yeah, we're working on probabilistic imagination models. But it was all about still the neuropsychological and the cognitive you know, nature of the human brain. So what our team argues is it doesn't take computationally you know, as much effort as we think it would when it comes to emulating the neuroplasticity and the neurogenesis attributes of the human brain. And also, the molecular biology, which we saw earlier, you know, those neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, you know, just a few uh, days earlier, uh, telin shared us uh, how the, you know, moth, uh, moth is, you know, some of the brain works. There is uh, this neurotransmitter called octopamine. So all these hormonal aspects of the human brain emulating into a machine will not be an easy task. That's a very difficult task, and our team believes it will not be a feasible or viable task in whatsoever circumstances. And then we have molecular the neurocytology, just, just like we saw earlier, and also the neuropsychiatric layers, they will not be immutable. So this is just how so, we build up, you know, just like from the so bottom we'll, up. Um, I very much like the chain of thought you're going through. At this point, the question would be, why would I need to um, worry about every aspect of uh, brain as an organic system, uh, why can't I simply use it as a black box saying brain can do X, Y, Z, computer can do X, Y, also do X, Y, Z, and hence they are, uh, you know, it's equivalent um, or, or you can, in that sense, you can say that um, um, you can take the opposing position that uh, a computer is as effective as a brain. You are you're trying to say the brain is very, way too complex, way, there are a lot of things involved in the brain, and we don't see how a computer can do all of those things. And mm -hmm. The question is, why can't the other side argue that, okay, let's look at what can we uh, observe in terms of brain, what can brain do? And then let us demonstrate that, but computer can do all of this. So if the computer can may, may not do in the same way that brain does, the computer's own architecture may not be as complex or as different as um, uh, a, a, as varied and as uh, nuanced and uh, you know as extensive as brain architecture at least not now. Uh, but uh, they can you know and maybe brain cell is very complex. Um, neuro cell, neuro Neuron is very complex, but uh, we can emulate everything that a complex neuron can do in a simpler volume and machine. If that is the argument you want to make, you know, what can you, why would you want to, or not, how would you want to argue that these things are special and indeed they cannot be, uh, the, what they do can has a clear real world manifestations and that computers can't repeat that or can't actually carry that out. What, you know, if you have that kind of argument that will make the things more yes. um, appealing for your side. Yes. So, uh, that's right. Uh, actually, the state of the brain, all those, those layers, you know, we discussed earlier, you know, there, has, there is still ongoing, you know, intensive research uh, going on to discover, you know, the discovery is still not, you know, finished. The discovery is still, you know, ongoing, right? Not even a lot of discoveries are coming up. So what I would say is, when it comes to, higher, for instance, the idea of thinking, last week we somehow barely touched upon this uh, uh, very good example by Douglas of Stanton, you said, right? As he drove from Bloomington, Indiana to Chicago, he was stuck in a freeway, mm -hmm. and he was traveling, driving the car, let's say, to give a lecture, to give a talk at uh, Chicago University, and something unexpected happened, okay? so. Uh, he had a lot of options to decide, okay? One was to either call the university when that was his destination, that he would be late by an hour or two, or to take some alternative routes that might, I don't know, unexpectedly, you know, make him end up, you know, even in, probably in a worse situation. So there are a lot of thoughts going on in his mind under that specific circumstance. So what his point ultimately was, uh, IBM Deep Blue defeated Gary Kasparov, not because IBM Deep Blue had 
a way more intelligence or some more intelligent than uh, Gary Kasparov, let's say. That was because of just a brute force process. So for every single move, the machine would make what it would uh, somehow calculate is what potential potential move would the opponent make. And it will do this kind of calculation, this kind of, you know, uh, forward and back calculations for so many steps, and it will take the steps that will lead to the best score, right? So that is still a brute force, a computational process. So it was just a mere computational power that somehow enabled IBM Deep Blue defeat Gary Kasparov, and not just because it had this what the idea of what God, the class of Star Trek says, thinking. So much there will not be even this idea of thinking in machines. And what Douglas of Saturday states is, you know, the world that we live in is not framed. But a game like Chase or uh, AlphaGo, even Tencent, a very big Chinese uh, company, you know, which had Kiko all those stuffs. Recently, they built a machine that defeated uh, one Chinese, a very popular uh, player. I forgot his name. Just a month ago, a news released. So that's not because these machines have this attribute of thinking. So. That's why, you know, all this, you know, the anatomical, molecular biology, neuropsychological, very important layers give rise to humans are capable to think under different situations. Another example, for instance. Can I ask very first yeah. question before you, you move? Uh, so before you taking that course about AI, uh, were you thinking that Deep Blue was smart or not? Before I took a course in AI, would I think, would I believe if the blue were smart? Yeah, obviously. Exactly. I would believe so that. that's, like when you know how things work, mm -hmm. you're going to start seeing that they are simple. That's what I mean. So, for example, now you're saying that uh, a human is not, a, you know, a uh, computer is not like a brain and so on, right? While in reality it beat the guy, right? But you're saying that it's not intelligent. But it's not intelligent, yeah. But it's defeated. So, what we are comparing here is uh, intelligence. How do we measure? What is our uh, KPI for intelligence? How do we measure intelligence? It all goes down to that point. Okay. So, just because uh, IBM Deep Blue defeated uh, Gary Kasparov, does it make it you know, the machine intelligent? No. And, uh, no. Just because, uh, let, let's say, the AlphaGo, uh, you know, defeated the, the machine, defeated, you know, the Korean player, the South Korean player, does it mean that the machine? No. It was all raw computational power. But I think no, no, that's, 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 so then that probably is true for chess, but not for the AlphaGo game. Yeah, I think even they said, the players said, that we saw some moves that they were really smart. We've never thought about them, and we learned from them. So. Yes. Just because we have a machine that bet Kasparov or a machine that bet the South Korean in AlphaGo doesn't mean the machine has all the intelligence that a human being has. Yeah. Uh, Doug Leonard's experiments uh, for over five years, possibly with 100 PhD students, the CYC experiments, were a major failure. That the computer doesn't have the kind of common sense mm. a human being has got nowhere near. Exactly. You know, uh, just a few a few months ago on Twitter, Dr. Shiv shared about HAL 9000, and I was so excited because 2001 Space Odyssey is probably one one of the best movies ever made. And in that movie, these guys compared how would Amazon Alexa respond, how would Amazon Alexa respond, and there was this miscommunication. For instance, Dave, you know, the astronaut, asks HAL, uh, opens the doors. And then the, the Amazon Alexa depiction responds by playing the legendary door singer by James Morrison, the you know their lead singer. So there was this miscommunication, you know, this happens. So actually, what Dave in that movie was asking was to open the doors, but what the machine was doing was playing the, the blues legendary songs, the doors. <laughs> so. There, we see all these instances in so many circumstances. So, how do we emulate totally the human brain? No, that will not be possible in any time. Singularity, 
they said in 2001 it would happen back in the 1960s, you know, the likes of Marvin Minsky. Even a very interesting fact is uh, 2001 Space Odyssey failed its mission, its mission towards Jupiter. But still, the movie was advised by Marvin Minsky. And Marvin Minsky was one of the protagonists of artificial intelligence. He was the you know, books like the Emotion Machine. So even this guy admitted that AI would still lack you know, the kind of intelligence that all this hype is all about. <laughs> so that's very important thing to know as well. Yeah. What is neuromorphic computing? Neuromorphic computing is basically uh, emulating the emulating the physiological and the anatomical layer of the neurons, the brain's neurons. That's how they developed at IBM by that chip called Tronos. So they accurately model uh, the neuronal connections and also the synapse connections between every single neuron to build more brain-like machine, brain-like chip. That's what they call neuromorphic computing. A physiological and anatomical depiction of a uh, version of a machine, so to speak. <coughs> Reverse engineering maybe means reverse engineering may allow to achieve singularity. Might be time is not a, like uh, whatever they say in uh, forty years. I don't know about that, but uh, people are approaching this problem in two ways. Like some people they are doing by using artificial intelligence, all these things. Some people they are doing reverse engineering, like uh, building connectome and uh, using that like and uh, building models of brain and uh, testing them. If, uh, like, uh, when I started uh, preparing for this topic, what I, like, uh, what I imagined is uh, if somebody, they're doing it, but it's a very difficult thing, building a connectome. If somebody builds the total uh, connectome of human brain and if somebody try to emulate that one, because I don't know, but uh, for uh, one uh, worm, C against worm, it worked, I don't know. It might work, we never know. And also computing also that uh, you shown one IBM chip, right? That, yeah, two yeah. Words, yeah. Computing also developing, and it, it's also developing. We, uh, maybe some kind of different computing may come, like some, some people, they might <coughs> try to create this plasticity you told, they might create that kind of uh, elements to do the computing. It, it's possible, singularity is possible, but they might create from reverse engineering. Yeah, but you know, reverse engineering and even now, there is all this talk about quantum computing, right? Previously, you know, machine representation was zeros and ones, now bits, right? Now they have what they call qubits, right? So it's been a while about this idea of quantum computing, but it's still reverse pattern recognition theorem and from the Ray Kurzweil, you know, reverse engineering the human's mind or the human's thoughts, still it is framed, just like Douglas of the Stutter said. You know, they are still playing within a framed scenario. But our world is not something framed, something that is, you know, set within a well-defined boundaries. We have all these sorts of unpredictable scenarios. So the, how to respond to these unpredictable scenarios, how can we emulate now? Actually, connectome thing, uh, they, they didn't create up to years. Ma even, uh, not even rat thing, but they created one thing. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, they didn't, uh, it's it's like uh, they, there is no program by using just the connectome. Uh, it's, it started moving, like a worm. If it see an obstacle, it come back. So uh, there is no, like uh, here, uh, yeah, they're not programming all of the things, but by using that, it is moving, right? Uh, I think we should not just look at the deep blue, I suppose. I mean, there's a master over out there, which is actually going according to its decisions. So, uh, I mean, we're actually developing in that way. So, uh, Definitely Mars is, a, I mean, uh, not a specific predictable. thing or predictable thing or that. There, there will be things like very pointy rocks and, and also snowstorms and everything. 
uh, in that uh, in that the agent is able to self repair itself and able to that is why it is uh, stuck for a long period of time and not able to move and the they yeah so yeah they right. but then they suddenly they move it, but now it is repairing itself right so initially they prepared it based on what we know here for example as you said pointy dogs no straw and everything uh -huh. so we already know those things exist here and it is prepared for that first time right yeah yeah so, for the first time uh, and and now what i'm saying is so we are developing such agents i mean like marsho or like agents to in order to learn itself and then and then avoid those circumstances so i i mean we are actually in a way developing those agents rather than just being in a closed room scenario and then doing something so with that technology and there is a chance that we would we would also be able to handle the real world situations in the future so i am going to show them the hal video oh. yeah, this would be of particular interest So Basically, you can. I think you need to step back and see. We, we, we see various things you, you can put your finger on. We know that computers can do things, some things better than humans can do. Yeah, um, they, they can play games. You know, computers can defeat on on a specific task like AlphaGo. Does it prove or disprove? Uh, we know that when humans are able to understand certain things for example humans develop a model for neuron and you know then you could represent that in a computerized model with mathematics and with uh, functions and whatever now we have discovered that neuron is not as simplistic as we thought before i think humans will figure out a way to again model that uh, so so when we know some complexity of related to brain that humans are figuring out are figuring out how to um, represent it how to emulate it how to perform in a similar way we know that too the question is we know now at the same time we know um, such things as imagination what what is the equivalent what have we found that computers do or uh, you know technology do in terms of imagination i had to be optimistic okay then then um, you know there, there are other things where i think it kind of it's interesting juncture for example emotion you uh, one would argue that emotion is a human you know thing but uh, then the people are developing robots that um, uh, you know have such a level of built in emotion when they take care of elderly is it people are developing robots and they're still working to develop robots to keep you know humans you know of old people don't have company and uh, uh, all they need is certain help again robots are being developed to do specifically that and i think that we can now the question will be yeah uh, uh, today they may be brittle tomorrow they would uh, be as good as uh, a servant servant you can hire and day after they may be as good as uh, or better than your own um, child because uh, your 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 child will get um, uh, you know annoyed and or uh, tired you know caregiver and this machine won't so we know that too and that those things are also coming the question is in spite of all of this 
where do we, you know, what, where, what can we say about singularity? Are we, are we going to find, um, are we going to say that, oh, we'll find, as we understand more about it, computer will reach, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to do something, so we're going to be on infinite match humans, right? Because every time you find something new, you can follow up, you can say, in infinite, we'll match. Well, or we will say that there is some intrinsic thing that so far at least we have not figured out how to do computationally or you even stronger argument on that will be that we can even prove that simply a there is no counterpart of this in machine. That those are the kind of arguments you need to and those are the stakes in the ground you need to put and argue. Hope it's clear. It's an ever chasing line. So if evolution automatically man coming out of chimpanzee over 2.5 million years, uh, only with two less than 2% difference in the DNA, but substantial difference in the behavior, you, you can say that I can program it. Could be an ever changing line given the brute force computational ability. Um, so, we may so, have to pick up what so, so um, the argument could be, uh, and I don't want to necessarily give up, but I'll go ahead and say this one, there'll be more. You can say that, look, in, in humans, uh, there's been this mutation. And these things happen that we not figure out how to do that in computers. Or are you argue that we figure out how to do it, whichever way it is. Right? So things happen with humans that we don't it's such a process. So point is not only the artifact and observable thing, but the point is how do you get to it? And you say, well, getting to this thing has had limitations and uh, these things, and well, you're not seeing how computers do that, so we don't think you'll ever get to it. So that's another form of arguments that you will come with. Exactly. Okay. Think along the line. Okay. Yes. In line of this, um, of this documentary, uh, there are these instances whereby you know, somebody gets a concussion on their head, you know, a severe concussion on their head, and all of a sudden they develop what they technically call savant like abilities. So somebody who previously never played, let's say, piano, after a concussion, becomes a very talented, exceptional piano in a specific genre, classical piano player. And somebody, somebody, let's say, for instance, once again hit by a concussion, they develop uh, extraordinary skills, like, for instance, calendar calculator. And you ask this guy, uh, on which day would uh, December 1st, I don't know, 2046, lie on and was in the blink of an eye? The gives the answer. So there are these kinds of you know uh, variations in how the human brain somehow you know reacts to different external factors, whatever you know. So how do we model this one in a machine? That is a, you know, a question. So that's why we are strongly arguing. You know, they will not we will not see singularity at least in our lifetimes. So the video just uh, this will be so interesting.
things about one film of his will do a lot in understanding things about a different film of his. And at the center of this big web of ideas is 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I thought I'd start connecting some dots by first dealing with 2001 and specifically HAL 9000. HAL's presence in the film is very little in the amount of time relative to the plot of the film, but a whole lot in regards to screen time. The film's plot spans millions of years, but the few days or so of HAL's screen time takes up a good chunk of the film. So that definitely makes it an important factor in the film. But what is his story, really? On the surface, all we really know is that he appeared to malfunction in some manner and try to kill the people aboard the ship. From there, we can assume so many things, so I'm just going to share precisely what I think happened during the Jupiter mission with HAL 9000. First, some information on HAL. During the TV interview with the astronauts, the interviewer explains... The HAL 9000 computer, which can reproduce, though some experts still prefer to use the word mimic, most of the activities of the human brain and with incalculably greater speed and reliability. In the interview, Hal says... Let me put it this way, Mr. Raymer. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error. Dave also says... Well, he acts like he has genuine emotions. Um, of course, he's programmed that way to make it easier for us to talk to him. But as to whether or not he has real feelings, it's something I don't think anyone can truthfully answer. Frank and Hal play a chess game, and while I'm not a chess expert, and so I can't really get into too much of the way that the game plays out, there is supposedly a mistake on Hal's part, in which he says... I'm sorry, Frank, I think you missed it. Queen to bishop, three. Bishop takes queen. Knight takes bishop. Thing. Supposedly it would make sense if it were queen to bishop 6. Odd that Hal just a few minutes ago explained his infallibility, yet he made a mistake. However, Frank doesn't notice this mistake, and Hal wins. Dave and Hal talk to each other, and Hal asks if Dave ha has had second thoughts about the mission. He then expresses worry about how the mission seems odd. Certainly no one could have been unaware of the very strange stories floating around before we left. Rumors about something being dug up on the moon. I never gave these stories much credence, but particularly in view of some of the other things that have happened, I find them difficult to put out of my mind. For instance, the way all our preparations were kept under such tight security. Sorry about this. I know it's a bit silly. Just a moment. Just a moment. I've just picked up a fault in the AE-35 unit. It's going to go 100% failure within 72 hours. Dave goes to retrieve the AE-35 unit and then runs some tests on it and finds that HAL 9000 was utterly wrong. The AE-35 unit is fine. HAL says... It's puzzling. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this before. I would recommend that we put the unit back in operation and let it fail. It should then be a simple matter to track down the cause. Before Frank dies, we see a shot that undoubtedly implies that Hal tries to kill him. Then when Dave decides to go out to save him, Hal says that he doesn't have much information on what happened to Frank, even though he definitely does. After Dave shuts down Hal, he gets a pre-recorded message explaining that, for security reasons, Hal 9000 was the only one aboard the ship that knew the purpose of the mission. And now that Hal has been shut down and the entire crew revived, it can be told to them. So what happened? There are two prevailing narratives, one of intention and one of mistake. Did Hal 9000 make a mistake and constantly try to clean it up, fearing for his own death? Or was every movie made calculated and done for specific, almost conspiratorial purposes? Well, regardless of which one you prefer, I think it's safe to say that both are very good ideas in their own right. If we accept that Hal, the infallible computer, made a mistake and covered to clean it up, then it's a tale of hubris. Icarus flying too close to the sun, so to speak. If we accept that Hal, the infallible computer, pretended to make a mistake for some goals, then it gets a little more complicated. But I lean towards the latter. Let me explain to you what I think is going on here. HAL 9000 is a liar. While some things like the chess game and the AE-35 unit malfunction could be seen as mistakes, I don't see them that way. If we look at the information, it seems to contradict itself a bit too much. 
The 9000 series is a perfect track record and is essentially infallible, and yet he screwed up multiple times. The 9000 series is able to calculate things faster and more reliably than any human brain, and yet when Hal figures out that the AE35 unit is malfunctioning, he takes a good 5 or so seconds to figure it out. We know he is capable of deliberately withholding information and acting as if he didn't have the information, because he talks about the suspicions of the mission, yet at the end we know that Hal 9000 was the only person aboard the ship who knew what the actual mission was about. When Hal kills Frank, the shot implies heavily that Hal intended to kill him. And then when Dave asks for more information, Hal says he doesn't have information on it, even though we know he did it. So Hal 9000 is a liar. That's an accusation that requires motivation behind lying. If you were really just making mistakes, his actions would be a result of faulty programming and trying to survive. However, the one thing that gives us a hint as to his motivation is this line. You're working up your crew psychology report. Hal is in charge of checking on the crew's psychology, and Dave calls attention to this right after Hal talks about his worries and suspicions about the mission. This seems to imply that Dave is aware that Hal is just trying to test him, and he didn't do what Hal wanted, which was to just give up like Frank did. Then Hal puts him to an even harder test with the AE-35 unit, go to replace it, it's broken. And when Dave actually checks to see if it's operational instead of just replacing it, Hal needs to test him again, this time by informing them that it was due to human error. What I think is really happening is that Hal's operations aboard the ship include keeping the astronauts under control in regards to the mission. The mission is only known by Hal, and as a result he has to keep them under his control. And he does this in subtle ways, but as Dave repeatedly keeps control on each test that Hal places over him, it causes Hal to jeopardize the mission by trying to kill the crew, almost as if it's the ultimate test for Dave. Since Hal knows that he is about to be shut down, he does whatever he can in his power to try to regain control. And he does this by taking away all control from Dave that he can. When Dave still manages to break through, Hal tries to convince him to stop shutting him down, a final desperate attempt at keeping control. So we can say that Hal has emotions, but I think his programming is the one thing that keeps him from being fully human. It's the fact that he is still set on the objectives of the mission from start to finish, his actions evolving around his objectives and programming, that prevents him from understanding genuine human emotions such as empathy. He is, in essence, a psychopath bent on one goal and doing whatever he can to get it. He seems calm at first because this is what is necessary to complete his goal. But then growth become much more violent because that is what is necessary to complete his goals at that point. So his motivation for lying is because he is programmed to maintain control of the ship at all costs, and his lack of humanity is ultimately what makes him the failure at the end of the segment. And there's also a chance that, since the message telling Dave about the actual objectives of the mission appears after Hal 9000 is shut down, implies that Hal was meant to be shut down in the first place, almost as if he wasn't making a mistake at all. His entire existence was just a test for Dave, the one who passed every time, whereas Frank failed and ultimately met a grim fate. Of course, this is only my interpretation of the events, and you don't have to agree with it. However, I feel as though this interpretation stacks up with the evidence presented by the film, and this is a necessary interpretation to relate 2001 to the gigantic web of connections that I spoke of earlier. So next time I come back to Kubrick, I'm most likely... Yeah. So, yeah. So this is a brief uh, story about the uh, Hal 9000. And, uh, just one question. Uh, cryptographic question. What do you think Hal... You know, that acronym uh, stands for, or let me put it this way, how do you think, you know, Hal was named after? What do you think it was named after? Think of something cryptographic. Anyways, that was what, you know, the company somehow hmm? declined to admit, but they say Hal, you know, the acronym HAL, stood for uh, just a one letter shift of IBM, every letter. I, H, B is A, and M is L, so hand, but uh, actually IBM didn't accept. That was what uh, actually it was it stood for. But actually it is heuristically programmed algorithm computer, that's what it is. So, yeah, this is a very good depiction of what AI, you know, just like I said, you know, even this picture, this movie was directed by Stanley Kubrick and advised, the director was advised directly by Marvin Milski, MIT, I love, and even one of the founding fathers of AI even admitted, you know, that we wouldn't. Okay, we'll see singularity, but somehow with all this, uh, you know, irregularities in between, so to speak. So that is an issue. And unfortunately, you know, the director Stanley Kubrick couldn't see somehow singularity in 2001. He passed away in 1999, you know, and he didn't even somehow manage to see 2001. Another movie was directed by Steven Spielberg. It was actually 
plan to be directed by Stanley Kubrick. So, yeah, it's interesting. The whole house, everything was built up all the way from, you know, Memex. It was inspired, and then after Clark, then John McCarthy came, all those stuff same. Here we are, so 2045, we see. Amazing to see, uh, you know, uh, that this movie was done at that time with such you know, advanced thinking. Right? So uh, you've got to give that credit. So as we discussed how a uh, brain is different from a computer till now, so there is another important part that we can't put consciousness in the computer at all. So there is a TED talk by Dan Dennett and based on that TED talk we have uh, received some facts regarding the consciousness. So the consciousness part of the brain is related to the pink and orange part that you are seeing here and uh, the parts of the brain which are uh, related to the consciousness are also identified and I will let you know in the other slide. So consciousness is generally uh, defined as being comprised of two important components. One is awareness and other is arousal. So when you wake, wake up every day morning you know that uh, what is your name and what are your relatives and what is the situation you are under and what are the tasks you have to do uh, on that day and uh, I mean so a person is aware, aware of his surroundings and his environment and the context is, he is in. So arousal is uh, regulated by the brain stem like you saw in the last figure. The portion of the brain that links up with the spinal cord and it regulates when we sleep and awake and our heartbeat and breathing as well. So awareness is more confusing and uh, it is not at all, it is not at pinpointed in which part of the brain it resides, but it resides somewhere in the cortex which is the outer layer of the brain. And uh, they identified two areas in the cortex that were linked up to the, uh, there are some biological terms, rostral, dorsolateral pontine tegmentum and were most likely to play a role in regulating consciousness. So one was the, the other parts are, one was in the left ventral anterior insula, which is AI, and the other was in the paginatal anterior cingulate cortex, PACC. So you can uh, search for these terms and see how we can model this in the computer. So in the cognitive neuroscience perspective, I'm about to uh, describe 10 important differences in clear. Uh, but the differences may seem generic, but when we go in depth, then we see how brain is different from the computer. So first <coughs> one is analog brains versus digital computers. So it's easy to think that neurons are essentially binary given that they fire an action potential if they reach a certain threshold and otherwise do not fire. The, so, the same thing in the computers are compared to zeros and ones and it presents a vari wide variety of continuous and non-linear processes that directly influence neuronal processing. So uh, in this for example, one of the primary mechanisms appears to be the rate at which neurons fire, which is essentially a continuous variable. So similarly, network of neurons can fire in relative synchrony and this coherence eff affects the strength of signals received by the downstream neurons. So finally, inside each and every neuron, there is a leaky integrator circuit composed of ion channels and continuously fluctuating membrane potentials. So if you observe this, uh, something that is happening in the brain is different from what is happening in the computer, which is just related to zeros and ones, which is binary. And the other thing is brain uses content addressable memory. So whereas machine uses byte addressable memory. So let's, let us look deep into what is con content addressable memory. 
So in computers, read operation uh, is performed in a traditional memory. That means input is the address location of the content and output is content of that address. But in content addressable memory uh, on which brain is working, is it is reverse. So input is associated with something stored in the memory and output is the location where that associated content is stored. So I will give you an example in the next slide. So in computers, information in memory is, is accessed by pulling its precise memory address, as we all know. And this is known as a byte addressable memory. In contrast, the brain uses content addressable memory such that information can be accessed in memory through spreading activation from closely related concepts. So for example, uh, when you think of a word fox, it may automatically spread activation in your memories related to other things like uh, the person you know or the animal names or the related movie names. So the end result is that your brain has kind of built in Google in which just a few cues or keywords are enough to cause a full memory to be retrieved. Right. So similar things can be done in computers mostly by building massive indices of stored data which then also need to be stored and searched through the for the relevant information through byte addressable memory but not content addressable memory. The next difference is massive parallel machines versus modular and serial. So here I'm comparing brain with a massive parallel machine and a computer to modular and serial machine. So it is an unfortunate legacy that brain-computer metaphor is a tendency for cognitive psychologists to seek out modularity in the brain. For example, the idea that computers require memory has led some to seek for the memory area where in fact these distinctions are far more messy. So we are just we just started to learn that memory regions such as hippocampus are important for imagination. Similarly, one could uh, imagine a language module in the brain, like uh, we have that natural language processing programs. But cognitive psychologists even claim to find this module based on patients with damage to region of called uh, brain's area called Broca's area. So more recent evidence has shown that language uh, is com computed by widely distributed and domain uh, general neural circuits in which Broca's area is associated to. Next uh, slide would be uh, the speed at which brain and computer works. So there is no fixed processing speed uh, in computers whether uh, and compared to humans. So, uh, all MacBooks are all uh, deep blue machines are all uh, machines made generally think alike, work alike and process alike, right? But all human brains uh, don't think alike and the rate at which the human brain responds to a question may not be uh, same. Yeah. So the main point you are making distinction between a brain and a computer here is uh, you are saying that the brain is dividing the memory into specialized areas of memory. Is that, is that what you are pointing out here? In this slide? In, in general, in, in your point here about the uh, brain and the memory. So okay. you are making the distinction that, you know, um, uh, the brain is using special areas. Each one for each particular. Yeah. So that's Purpose. the difference you are making, right? Yeah. So what about the uh, program space and so on that we have for programs that are specialized for areas each. in memory in the computer that can store for each program and each. Yeah. Exactly. That is why, I mean, that there is a difference in processing, whereas the outcome may be the same for brain and computer, but there is difference in the implementation and processing, right? Yeah. I think so if we want to compare uh, neuroscience with computer organization, they are completely, there is, there is no, no, no comparison at all, I mean, they are not similar, right? But we are talking about, I mean, a higher level, about the results. They do the same thing, right? As what you say, uh, we have a special areas where we save memory, right? This is flush and mud, and that's electrons and uh, silicon. So, yeah, as I said, there is no fixed processing speed in a human brain. So if you ask a bunch of 10 people the same question, the rate at which they respond or they think may be different from one person to another. 
So how that uh, happens uh, in brain? So the speed of neural information processing uh, has many constraints in the brain. So it is a <coughs> bunch of electrochemical signals to traverse axons and dendrites in the brain. And the diffusion time of these neurotransmitters across these synaptic clefts and differences in synaptic efficacy, so all these uh, measures affect the way you think and respond to a similar question posed to a bunch of people. So although, although there are individual differences in what psychometricians call processing speed, this speed uh, in indexes a heterogeneous combination of all speed constraints mentioned above. So similarly, this, there does not appear to be any control central lock in the brain. For example, the cerebellum is often thought to calculate information involving precise timing as required for delicate motor movements, which also uh, motor movements are your limbs or uh, uh, your limb movement or your lip movement or the way you scatter your eyes for a vision. So recent evidence suggests that timekeeping in the brain bears more similarity to ripples on a pond than to a standard digital lock you found in a computer. Um, and also... Asha, you should know by this time that such a busy slide is not... Uh, uh, I have put that information because those terms are biological and... Uh, I totally understand, but yeah. reading the slide is never a good idea of presentation. It requires a tremendous job of remembering it. I understand that. Yeah. That doesn't still... But the idea here is all the terms in this slide are uh, biological terms and I the synaptic I precisely and understand. Yeah. Still. <laughs> yeah. In the previous slides you mentioned that the computer is a, a serial possible machine with the brain that are in the machine, right? But uh, we have parallel processors of the computers. So does that make any difference? We are uh, having these on final computers. They are able to perform operations on the brain. Yeah, I mean, I call brain a massive parallel machine because it not, I mean, if a computer is a process of something in parallel, it is only meant for that task to perform in parallel, right? It can't perform the other task uh, that can, uh, that brain can perform at the same time. So, for example, if we have a deep blue here and we asked it to play the game, it can only play the game at this instance and can't think about anything else. But Gary can also play the game at the same time. He can think of something uh, about the winning or about the next task he has to do in his subconscious mind, maybe. Maybe because we made uh, that system like that. We yeah, so it is designed for a specific yeah. purpose, but it's not uh, too generic like a human brain. Because we don't need that. Sorry? Because we don't need a such a system that can do everything. I, I think yeah. the computer can do okay. more parallel programs than a human can do. I mean, it could parallelly run different number of programs or different number of things. Yeah, building so, building uh, better machines doesn't mean that we built an equivalent machine compared to a brain, right? But the better means something different than equivalent. Yeah. Equivalent so we, our discussion here is uh, comparing brain to a computer, right? Yes. So you built a, I mean, we have built a better computers who can do massive parallel processing, but it doesn't mean it is equivalent to human brain. Yeah, no, Even no, if you no. discuss, uh, yeah. But your point is that, uh, so computers could do parallel processing, so brain can do parallel processing and computers cannot do serial processing and similarly brain stores memory in a different way and computer stores memory in a different way and then speed, yeah, brain, brain is slow, which is you said, and then computer speed. So that doesn't make brain, uh, computer not a brain, right? Yeah. So, so brain is not a computer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that doesn't make brain is a computer, right? With, with your argument? That doesn't make brain a computer, yes. Yeah, that doesn't make you say brain is not a computer, right? You can explain that. Add a point to there. You know, I, I'm quite enjoying the differences of the kind yeah. of exploration. But it is already published once that the clock speed of the latest computers is 10 to the power of minus 9 seconds. Whereas most known neurons, even in uh, the quickest human brains, mm -hmm. are at millisecond or second level.
So the digital computer is order of double order of magnitude faster than a human computer, a human brain. Right. Uh, that's why in chess it is able to look at a depth of five or six in much lesser time than even Gary Kasparov can calculate the depth. Right. Okay. Yeah, but. Uh, that I think that's where the analogies break down because um, one thing is that um, the model, uh, the architecture of brain, the speed may be extremely fast, but the architecture of brain is fast, potentially is much more simplistic compared to the architecture of uh, any building block of brain, like neuron is far more complicated than was originally thought. There's another um, possibility that brain is um, a binary, you know, does the work in binary, uh, you know, so you can have two to the power, uh, power of something, right? And uh, that brain is, the brain is not, uh, you know, necessarily doing random binary. It has actually, I don't know, I, 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 I a real number. I, I that means I would be no. giving million okay. to the power of uh, one, uh, right? Uh, to, to the entire, power of something. Entire um, DNA hmm. of trillion bytes equal hmm. has only four letters. Hmm? A digital computer has two letters, zeros and ones. Mm. Instruction, data, mm. uh, what all that, right? Mm. Whereas the DNA is only four letters. So it's not analogous, it's a pure four discrete machine with four, and every protein has only four there. That is not true, right? Because uh, so so that the, even though that may be true, uh, it may that is a machinery to create uh, you know the cells and uh, exactly. uh, the, the now I'll ask you. A Google, just as Google is a content uh, address memory, at a higher level of abstraction, a human computer, if you argue that it's a content-based address um, machine, right? Like give me name, um, uh, now, I mean, a lot of things come into my mind, right? Um, at a lower level, possibly it is using that four-letter search, um, all right? I, maybe you should explore that. Uh, so digital computer is binary and location specific at a lowest level. Application level, it is content address. So you, you, you need to possibly dig in for more unanswered questions. Comparing physical characters, it doesn't mean that you could say that brain is not a computer. Yeah, the analogy here is that computer could also do some parallel tasks like that, but it's not actually but a similar doing, task. It's not actually doing it because no, we did not develop spinning. it like that. Cycle spinning has been having for 40 years where the CPU would do background processing while you are driving. Yeah, the auto car can drive and, and <coughs> in between two, two cycles it can be every two cycles it can be thinking about it and get past that. Huh? Right? Well, it's something like uh, you cannot say that, uh, so you have to code it and like, think about Italian pasta or something similar. But a human can think about any random thing. That's a code it. Oh, yes, a baby learns all these things. The code exists in the DNA. <laughs> <laughs> the huge code is in the model that we don't I'm just not getting <laughs> No, I would want, see there is what is called a subconscious mind. If, if at all there is a mosquito, uh, there is no mosquito, it's double yes. And it starts biting me. Without me knowing it, my hand would kill it, right? Yeah. But that also you can program. Yeah. There are sensors w which are intrinsically parallel. And they, based on what they sense, the computer would be doing at that part differently. So the main computer is driving the car and maybe the sensors are doing different other things. So or I, I would love you to argue more strongly. But how can we program consciousness? I don't know what is consciousness. Yeah, consciousness itself is a very controversial topic. Uh, and there is no uh, consensus on consciousness yet. 
what it actually is, including how to run various definitions, various people, the various so Maybe she can tell us what consciousness is. Well, she has given as soon as you can describe something, you can program it, right? Exactly. That's what, so, that's what the wide way of going actually. So. Yeah, I already discussed about the consciousness as two important components, awareness and arousal. What happens the in arousal, the arousal, sorry, awareness thing, uh, we are not clear, right? But you only mentioned we are not clear about uh, awareness thing. That arousal I mean, thing, we can, uh, yeah, systems, systems can say the tasks and they can remember <coughs> what they have to do, all those things. But awareness thing, you only told that. Uh, yeah, th uh, scientists are not able to pinpoint which part of the brain is exactly responsible for awareness. So, that in that way they are not clear, but they are clear that consciousness but what is has awareness? components. Awareness is... You think awareness is not doing something wrong and keep doing always the right thing. I don't know. Even then you could program it. It is a computer. Generally it doesn't do the kind of crimes that human beings do. So it possibly it has a better idea, better consciousness. Tell me which robot would kill. Stop there. Whereas you saw the human being killing that. So look, look at the autonomous cars, like Google, right? How many accidents the car had? Like two times and five millions of miles. So it's more aware and more conscious than a human. So it's more intelligent. How do you think that uh, it's avoiding killing humans? Huh? How do you think that it is avoided killing humans in accidents? How do you think it did that? What was the technique behind it? Do you I have to consider all the probabilities? So no, I should that exactly. So it's a progressive, progressive it, model. Yeah. So, so actually there was a test by Stanford, right? right? Mm -hmm. That they, they want to see how to make the machine learning more and more and more ethical. Even right? now the right cop And then you know, right instead of hitting so many people, you hit one. Or instead of hitting somebody, you hit a wall. Yeah, so so they, that's the they kind of thing. basically do some kind of recognition to see how many skulls are identified. Exactly. If there is one skull, if there is five skulls, they will kill the one skull. Uh, they won't kill if there are five skulls. But if there are... Uh, Instead of, uh, there are five skulls on both sides, five humans, yeah. and one human and four animals, straight out, so something, then whom would you kill? Or that's even uh, that's even an open question for a human. It's, yeah. it's not like it's something not I can give you an answer for. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so a hypothetical right. so scenario that could be The question. morality, it cannot be programmed, that was what I was saying. I think, I think you can program minimizing the uh, casualties, right? Instead of saying that I want to make the machine more moral. Right? Yeah, it is. What the number of casualties is the uh, same in both the scenarios, then what will you do? What will you choose? There what comes the question. That uh, becomes very personalized. Yeah. I think that's an open question for yes. human again. Yes. So yeah. it's, yeah. you cannot expect something from a machine if you cannot even uh, rely because on a even human, human to talk. Even human cannot give an ex exact answer for the how the I'm going to train the machine to learn that. And even differ from every <coughs> human, like which option to choose. Yeah, and if, oh. if if one person there is my mom and there are another three strangers, I will hit the three strangers. Yeah. So that is not how this is similarity. So this is not a difference of similarity. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so what happens are in our group. You are more weight and you are willing to be people. The way this is the shirage to us. So now. So you gave more weight to not killing your mom and kill yeah. three people. So 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 basically, so no. Uh, the point is that you were able to assign the weight by yourself. If you were able to do that with the whatever data that you have been exposed to since your birth, why can a machine not learn that particular thing? With similar data being exposed to it, learning that uh, mother is more important than other three pedestrians. I mean, it can for sure. Yeah, the question is whether we want to do that or not. Or whether we drives, want to according to the experience man who is the 50 
360 and drive for 20 years with experience. With all the priority, how to speed, where to, low mileage, high mileage. So these are came by experience to learn. But if somebody suddenly in age of 17, 16 take car, so ex exactly they do many mistakes. What if if I, that doesn't matter the all the priority. What, what if you hate your mother? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, that's right. How can we model so many things inside a machine? Exactly, that's, that's a human, like a human, right? There is something analogous. We are agreeing here. You agreed with us. <laughs> there is uh, something analogous between the entropy of the systems would only decay but not the, keep there. And but human beings are part of it. They can become destructive. But a nicely written computer can never be destructive. So there is a possibility that the robots will be better behaved than a normal human being. And we clearly point out that brain is not a computer, they are different. Yes. All right, so we are going to take a break.